second installment here about talking about state legislatures and development and diversity. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit uh, about how they fit into the larger scheme of, uh, of state legislative uh, and, and state government capacity building. So if we take a look at the idea of state legislative modernization, it really is kind of part of a larger trend that occurred in, in government. Uh, part of this is really the result of the federal government starting to spend more money and funnel that money through the states. The states had to become increasingly more capable in order to be able to handle what the federal government was sending to them. So in thinking about this, the state legislative reform movement really kind of comes out of a larger reform movement of state governments. A couple of things occurred. So for example, uh, other institutions such as the state constitution were modernized. Uh, really the movement began in the 50s and 1960s, is that kind of trend that you see there. Uh, to modernize state constitutions. And if you take a look at the U.S. Constitution, it's a fairly sparse document that basically just sets out kind of the foundations of American government, who can participate, the institutions, how those institutions are going to work together. It's not really a policy document, right? Uh, there is some policy, I suppose you could say, written into the, uh, the Bill of Rights and, and the additional amendments to the Constitution, but it's a pretty sparse document without public policy. What had happened over the course of the late 1800s and, and first half of the 1900s was that special interests realized that they could protect their special interests a little bit better if they would get something put into the state constitution as opposed to typical statutory law. So what we saw was an enlargement of state constitutions over the course of that period. And really there's a lot of stuff that was in state constitutions that shouldn't have been. Again, they should be this kind of foundational document that sets the trajectory of government but doesn't really concern itself with specific areas of policy. So we saw this kind of state constitutional modernization movement. Uh, the goal was to strip this down to a foundational document, uh, and that's occurred in most states. Now, to be honest with you, if, if I were to pull up a, a copy of the Pennsylvania State Constitution right here, we'd see that it's substantially longer than the U.S. Constitution as is the case with, uh, with, with most state constitutions. Uh, primarily because they deal with issues of local government uh, and local government regulation uh, and uh, you know, various court systems in much more detail than the U.S. Constitution does. But there are other areas of policy that are generally in state constitutions which you don't have the specificity in the U.S. Constitution. So you know, there's a lot about education, a lot about taxation and finance and so forth that are in state constitutions uh, that are not normally in the U.S. Constitution. The short of it is the idea behind this was let's make it more flexible for the governor and the legislature to work by taking what we consider to be normal legislation out of the state constitution and just having that be regular legislation as opposed to be enshrined in the constitution. And that allows the legislature and the government to do their job a little bit more quickly uh, and not have that constitutional barrier there. The second thing that we saw was that as the capacity of uh, legislatures was increased, so was the capacity of governors to be able to act as well. So there were a couple of things that went along with the strengthening of the institutions of the executive branch, particularly the governor. One was obviously if the governor was going to be able to address problems better, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the state legislature, we saw an increase in the amount of staff for governors uh, around the country. Right? So that was important. The second thing that we see is uh, that there was an effort made to streamline the amount of statewide elected officials uh, in various states. Now, there are some states that still elect, you know, uh, you know, up to 10 different people. You know, some states still elect insurance commissioners and agricultural commissioners and so forth. Most states have streamlined that process. And the goal here is let's allow a governor to come in when they are elected and appoint people to the various state agencies uh, that are in tune with the goals that they want to accomplish. As a consequence of that, what we see is that we can then hold the governor accountable for what happens in statewide offices. If an independently elected person is responsible for policies in specific areas, they are not beholden to the governor. They can follow the policies that they want or the interests of the uh, constituencies that elected them.
right? So the goal is to have as few statewide officials as possible. And New Jersey really is kind of the poster child for this. Uh, up until the last couple of years, actually, in New Jersey, the only statewide elected official for state government uh, was actually the governor. <clears throat> there was not even an elected lieutenant governor. Uh, but due to some circumstances, uh, two consecutive governors left office before the end of their term. James McGreevy left as a re result of a scandal. Uh, Christine Todd Whitman uh, was, uh, was nominated by George W. Bush and, and became uh, his first secretary of the Environmental Protection Agency. So in both those situations, uh, New Jersey was left without a governor. And under the old Constitution, what happened was the president of the Senate became the acting governor. Now think about that. The president of the Senate remains the president of the Senate and at the same time is the, act is the active governor. So this violates a number of principles of you know, separation of powers and checks and balances. Uh, you know, it hadn't been a, a regular recurring function, so nobody really thought too much about it. But then you had two consecutive governors doing the same exact thing. And as a consequence of that, uh, New Jersey changed its state constitution. But still, very sparse. Two elected officials at the statewide level, the governor, lieutenant governor. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we elect a couple of extra people. So we have, obviously, the governor, lieutenant governor. Uh, and below that, we elect the attorney general, the auditor general, and the treasurer. Uh, the Auditor General and Treasurer, generally because they investigate fraud, malfeasance, the spending of, of state funds. Uh, and we only added the Attorney General as being an elected official uh, in 1980. And the idea here was that we'd want uh, somebody who would have the power to investigate a governor independently because they were not appointed by the governor. Uh, independently elected official would have uh, the wherewithal to be able to, uh, and, and, and independence to be able to investigate a governor, and that was the idea, uh, particularly, as you might imagine, post-Watergate at that time period. Uh, a couple of other things. One was the governors traditionally had two-year terms. They were trained to four years to make them uh, more invested in their office. And then finally, uh, a more highly professionalized state bureaucracy. Now. One of the other things that's led to the increased capacity of state legislatures uh, has been the idea of policy diffusion. Uh, national organizations are set up to help uh, transfer a number of different ideas around the country among different state legislators. Uh, and this idea of best practices, uh, this idea of states being laboratories of democracies is very important. right? So, what we see is, in general, if one state adopts a policy and it works, other states will adapt that policy to their specific conditions. And oftentimes, uh, we call this kind of the diffusion of ideas. Oftentimes, uh, what we see from most of the literature is that states will adopt something that is similar to their ideology or something similar to what states around them are doing. Now, one of the, the primary ways that we, uh, we see this diffusion is through national organizations. So uh, the example we use here is the National Conference of State Legislatures. Um, if you click through here, the National Conference of State Legislatures is set up as a nonpartisan institution. Uh, and we unfortunately don't have access to a lot of this material, but if you were a state legislator, you could click through and there are all types of issues and contact people at the NCSL. So if you're working on an issue, say around the issue of adult education, after school programs, agriculture, whatever, there are people that you can actually talk to uh, and ask them about what's currently going on, what are the ways some states are dealing with problems, how do we work on this issue, right? In addition to that, there's a lot of research that's done uh, that helps people out. So there are all kinds of issues, areas you can see here, energy, education, labor, and so forth. Uh, and uh, there are all kinds of issue briefs that are done. And in addition to that, there's a lot of bill tracking that goes on. So NCSL keeps a database of basically all the bills that are initiated in state legislatures in a given year. So if you're interested in seeing what are other state legislators doing on this issue, you can then tap into this network and these resources, uh, and that will help you understand those sort of things. Now, as I mentioned, NCSL is a nonpartisan organization set up to help everybody around the country. Uh, there is, however, a fairly strong organization of conservative state legislators that's set up to diffuse issues related to conservatives 
uh, and their ideology on state legislation. Uh, and that's the American Legislative Exchange Council, commonly referred to as ALEC. Uh, so kind of some of the same things that you saw there with the NCSL. Uh, conservative state legislators belong to this organization and they're pretty effective at creating kind of model legislation. Uh, one thing that I didn't put a link through here is the Council of State Governments. Uh, this is available, uh, you know, for any type of official, but oftentimes uh, there are uh, also organizations related to state legislatures. Uh, they put out a, uh, an annual book of model state legislation which basically takes the most current issues that are of interest to state legislators and puts out a couple of what they call model pieces of state legislation which legislators can then use to adapt to their specific conditions. So Alan Rosenthal talks about uh, capacity and capacity building and the way that state legislators build capacity is through what he calls the five S's. Space, sessions, structure, staff, and salaries. So most of the rest of these modules are going to focus in on those five S's. Let's start off with the idea of space. So I showed you in the last module a picture of the Pennsylvania State Legislature and taking a look at it from the back end of the Capitol, you saw this you know, kind of massive reorganization, rebuilding of, of the state uh, facilities there. That's something that's really occurred over the last 30 to 40 years in Pennsylvania, it was in the 1980s. So in general, what used to happen in state legislatures is that you had a desk within the state uh, Senate or the state House of Representatives. Uh, in some cases there might be a phone, in some cases there wouldn't be, and that's where you conducted your business while you were uh, acting as a state legislator. The idea now was that as we professionalize state legislators, legislators should have their own offices where they can meet with constituents, where they can meet with interest groups, where they can talk with other state legislators, where they can do their business and research. Uh, and uh, in, in many state legislatures across the country, that's the case. Now, even in, in a highly professionalized state legislature like Pennsylvania, there may be office suites where individuals, uh, you know, share an administrative assistant. Uh, but for the most part, every everybody has their own office within the Capitol. Uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, again, as a highly uh, 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 professionalized state legislature, we have uh, uh, district offices. Uh, so most members of the state legislature opt. Uh, to have districts, uh, you know, di offices back in their districts to help out with constituent services. Um, you know, in, in my case, I happen to live uh, uh, in, in uh, Montgomery County, and our state legislator, Stephen McCarter, happens to share kind of an office suite with Brendan Boyle, who is our, is our U.S. representative. Uh, and oftentimes, what they'll do is they'll have joint open houses. Uh, because what happens oftentimes is, you know, you, you'll come in to talk to Representative McCarter, but it'll turn out that that's really a federal issue, not a state issue. And then you can go over to Representative Boyle's office, or if Representative Boyle has somebody come in for an open house uh, that's really a state issue, you can send them over to Representative McCarter. Uh, but these are ways for members of the legislature to keep in contact with their constituents. Uh, and then finally, obviously, technology upgrades uh, has been part and parcel of this space. Uh, another thing that we can focus in on is the idea of the length of sessions. Uh, it was typical in a non-professionalized state legislature in the old days, quote unquote, uh, really to only have sessions every two years. Uh, what we see is there are only six uh, states that still only have uh, sessions once every two years. Uh, Arkansas, Montana, Nevada, North Dakota, Oregon, and Texas all meet in odd years uh, and only in those odd years. So, you know, uh, 2017, 2019, 2021. Uh, the remaining 44 states meet on an annual basis. Uh, now, how long they meet on an annual basis uh, varies by state. And we'll talk a bit more about professionalization of state legislatures coming up uh, in the next module. Uh, but a professionalized state legislature meets you know, pretty much year round, the same as Congress, so about 300 days a year. Uh, a citizen legislature which again doesn't have a large amount of professionalization. There are big variations on how often they would meet, uh, as you can see here, between 45 and 258. But most citizen legislatures meet for a relatively short amount of time, with the average being around 70 days or a little bit over two months. And then hybrid legislators are somewhere in between. Uh, they meet for about a third of the year. Usually, uh, those kind of hybrid and citizen legislatures will meet early in the year 
uh, and commence uh, you know, sometime in the spring or early summer uh, and will not meet again until the following January. And the final thing that we take a look at here is the length of legislative terms. Um, you know, there's a feeling back uh, at the turn of uh, at the revolutionary era that once you got away from one year terms of office, that was when tyranny begins. Uh, we've made these terms of office a little bit longer. Uh, there is a fairly normal cycle here in state legislatures. So 46 states have their House terms, two years, which is the same as we see at the national level, U.S. House of Representatives. Four have four-year terms. Uh, and in the Senate, uh, the 75 percent of all state Senates have four-year terms uh, with a quarter two-year terms. So in Pennsylvania, uh, we've got the 203 members of the State House, uh, and they're up for re-election every two years. With the 50 members of the State Senate, uh, every other election, uh, half of them will be up. So 25 or were up in 2016, the other 25 in 2018, and then we'll see the cycle start again uh, in 2020. All right, so it's the first couple of S's as we see here uh, from Rosenthal, and we'll pick up with a couple more in the next module.